The world star behind now everyone can fly. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to Dance Street daughter Tony Fernandez. Evening, young number, Bahamat Tunahate, young number Bagia Tun Sidiasma, ministers, uh, ambassadors. And all of you who I fly, hope only fly Air Asia. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you to the organizers uh, for having me today. I have 15 minutes to speak about my life. And like Air Asia, I will be on time. <laughs> well, we're not always on time. So, um, it's actually a great honor for me to be here today because the man who actually gave me the chance with Kamaruddin and Aziz and Dr. Pahamin to start AirAsia is sitting in right in front of me today. And 18 years ago, we went to see him in Putrajaya with a dream of uh, starting AirAsia. And I was listening to his speech just now about punctuality. I was so scared about seeing him. The appointment was at 9.30. I turned up at Putrajaya at 6 in the morning, so I wouldn't be late. And, uh, well, the rest is history. So, I'm going to tell you my life, my life story. This is a, a very high-tech presentation, and really we are in a very high-tech environment, and we're very low cost. So, I'm not used to this, so please bear with me for a second. I dressed up today because I told it was, told it was very formal, and then I saw YB side Sadiq, and I thought, wow, I could have dressed worse than him today. Um, he was in trainers. <laughs> so anyway, my story, I uh, grew up, I was born in Malaysia, in KL. I was sent to boarding school in England when I was 13 years old. I had never been outside of Malaysia, and it was strange for me. The first thing when I arrived at Heathrow Airport was everyone was white. I had never seen so many white people before. I told my daughter, you have no such problem when you get to London now because everyone is Indian when you get to Heathrow Airport. And so you'll feel quite at home. But that back then, it wasn't so easy. It was an interesting uh, five years at boarding school. I loved sport. My parents wanted me to be a doctor but I had no intention of doing medicine. And that was the first kind of big revolution for me. And that's the first piece of advice I want to tell everyone here. It's your life. And you should decide what you want to do, not what your parents want you to do. And I find so many people doing things that really they have no passion uh, to do. And so I think in Malaysia, we have incredibly talented people. So really, live your life. Don't let your parents tell you what to do. It's really your life. And so I didn't do medicine. Um, I didn't actually know what to do after my A-level, so I went and became an accountant, which was really the worst time of my life because I really hated accountancy. But I hated it so much that I passed everything first time. And then I became an auditor, which is the worst job in the world. Um, I'm sorry if there are any auditors out there. Actually, are there any auditors out there? 
Anyone? Okay, I can't, well, if I could see someone, I'll give you a free ticket. <laughs> because you deserve it being an auditor. <laughs> anyone? Can anyone put their hand up? Okay, you're all probably going to lie anyway. Remember what Tun Mahate say, tell the truth. So, um, I wrote to every record company, because I was a musician, I played keyboards, and every record company uh, rejected me. And so, I um, got one interview with a company called Virgin Records. And I was, went for the interview, and I got rejected as well. And as I was coming out, the owner of Virgin was walking in, and his name was Richard Branson. So this is the second lesson for everyone here. Take your chances. So there were two options. Do I just smile and be polite like most Malaysians, or do I grab the chance to try and get that job? So I said something, I can't remember what. I was talking about Sarawak or Orang Utans or something to Richard Branson, and he started talking to me, and he said, let's have a coffee. You're an interesting guy. And then we were sitting and talking, and he said, why are you here? I said, well, I came for a job interview and you rejected me. And he said, well, there's something special about you, so I'm going to give you a job. And that was my big break. And so that's the second lesson. Grab your chances, you know. If you have a chance, don't analyze it. Don't ask your grandmother. Don't ask your grandfather. Don't ask all your friends. Maybe ask Tun Mahate. And and then just go for it. Because life is short. And sometimes when we analyze too much and think too much and look at risk too much, the chance goes, just goes past us. So my whole life, I've just taken a risk. Don't worry about failure. If you fail, try again. Because you don't want to sit there at 55 and say, I wish I did it. Because it's too late. You can't press that rewind button. So I was in music business for 12 years, and uh, I decided to leave the music business uh, one day in 2001, and I really got tired of Americans telling me what to do. And so I thought I really wanted to start my own company. And I was sitting in a bar in London, drinking a Rabina, and thinking, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And I saw a guy called Stelios of EasyJet talking about his low-cost airline. I thought, wow, that looks really interesting. So I went to an airport in the north of London, a low-cost airport. It'd be really good if we have a low-cost airport in Malaysia. And uh, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> with low airport tax. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've got to grab the chance when the boss is in the house. <laughs> and so um, I was in London, in Luton Airport, and I was seeing this airline called EasyJet. It was orange, and everyone was flying to Barcelona for eight pounds and Paris for six pounds. And I thought, I'm going to do this. Now, there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity. It's very, very narrow. But I thought, I'm going to try. If I fail, I'll become a politician. Uh, <laughs> like YB side Sadik. And <laughs> so this will be the last time I'll ever be talking in front of them. But which is the lesson again, take your chances. You only live once. And if you fail, you fail. At least you try. So I came back, I roped in my, my dear friend from the music business, Kamarudin, and he never asked me about the business plan. He said, this is a great idea. Let's do it 50-50. And I said, no, 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 this is my idea. I want to be 51. And <laughs> But in the end, it was 50-50 between me and Dan. And so, we, we started doing this AirAsia plan. We had no money, just an idea, right? We had no sugar daddy, 
No sugar mommy. You know, I saw YB Teresa Cock there writing a check. I thought, wow, would it be nice if I had a minister sugar mommy like YB Teresa <laughs> writing me checks. I saw Malayan bank check, YB. <laughs> so, um, but we had an idea. And we got in a guy called Dato Pahamin, who was KSU. He used to help me fight piracy. And I know no one in this stadium has ever bought a pirated CD because you're all very honor honest and good Malaysians. <laughs> Please don't buy pirated products. And so we um, asked Dato Pahamin, can we see Tun Mahate? This was in 2001, and we got to see Tun, four of us. And uh, we, we made the presentation to Tun in his office. He wasn't well. Um, he had two important appointments beforehand. The first appointment was the opposition, Lim Kit Siang and Fadil Noor, who had come to talk to him about Anwar Ibrahim's back operation in Germany. And the second was Malaysian Airlines, who was talking to him about their restructuring. So I thought there was no way we were going to get the chance. And Tun's office is quite large. Actually, you could land a plane in the office. Uh, so he took a long time to get to see me. I shook his hand. He said, make it fast. I'm not feeling very well. So he thought, okay, this is really tough. Did the presentation. Small little reaction from Tun when I said, uh, we're going to destroy Singapore and Singapore Airlines. Uh, and then at the end of it, he said, you have my blessing. And we were like, wow, for two nanoseconds. And he said, but no new airline license. You have to go and buy an airline. Uh, he said, I've had too many failed airlines. And there's no exaggeration here, and I'm not making up stories, um, because it can be corroborated. Uh, but he knew everything about low-cost airlines. It was really very, very impressive. And so we thought, OK. We came out of the meeting. We were thrilled. We'd met Tun. We were so excited. And then Kamaruddin said, how do we buy an airline? We don't have any money. <laughs> so I said, you know, and it's amazing what you can do with positive energy. And so we, we went and we found two airlines. There was an airline called Palangi Air, where you had to be God or pretty close to God to turn around that airline. I have never seen financials like that in my life. In fact, the balance sheet didn't balance. And those accounts should be in Museum Nagara. And then there was AirAsia, which was owned by a great company called DRB Highcom. And we said, um, can we buy this airline from you? And the owner said, you can have it. Uh, we really hate it. Uh, <laughs> And then he said, how much do you want to pay for it? And I said, one ringgit. <laughs> and he said, you can still have it tomorrow. And I thought, damn, I should have said, pay me to take away this airline. <laughs> but that's what it was. On December, September the 8th, 2001, we took over AirAsia with two planes and about 15 million of debt and 254 terrified staff. And as you can see from the pictures, um, that was it. And then we changed it from a blue airline with a bird to this, which is uh, a red airline. Why did I use the cap? Because we had no money. And so I had to run around. This was, our, this was the brand. We had to run around with this cap. And we became disruptors with a low-cost airline. And over the last... 18 years, we've gone from two planes to 260 aircraft, from 200,000 passengers to now 100 million passengers. And we are the 13th largest airline in the world. And it all started in Malaysia. So really, we can be the best, and we can do anything we want to do if you put your mind to it. And over the last... Um, you know, 13, 18 years or 17 years, we have carried over half a billion people. We have built airlines all over ASEAN. 
and we've won the world's best low-cost airline 11 times in a row. No airline has ever done that before. And we the, the MC was a little bit out of date. We just won the 11th two weeks ago in Paris, which was really fantastic. So as Tun has always taught us, we Malaysians can do anything we want if we put our mind to it. And I really believe it because we're an amazing country, we have amazing people, we have diversity, we have a can-do attitude. We should just go out there and do it and show the world what we can do. And AirAsia in this little world way has shown that we can be the world's best. And, and what is our secret? Our secret is our people, really, that we have amazing people. We have 21,000 staff, we have no unions, we're a meritocracy, you know, we just have great people, and we do anything. And as listen, Tun's speech was really a lot of what I believed in. You know, when I started at AirAsia, I carried bags, I um, was a cabin crew, I was a check-in assistant, because I think CEOs cannot be effective leaders unless they go down to the ground. And, you know, it's, it's the... It's the final kind of part of my story. I discovered we had so much great talent in AirAsia. Uh, and a lot of the talent didn't have opportunities to go for further education, to less school at 13. And I thought it didn't matter whether you went to Oxford or Cambridge. As long as you had a brain, I was going to make you a diamond. And that has been our secret. And today I'll introduce you to some of them. And we've put, gone to a lot of places. We've gone to a lot of uh, cities but it's all driven by passion and a can-do attitude. And I'd like to invite some of my amazing all-stars, we call our staff all-stars, um, to come on stage, wherever they are. So these are 12 of 20,000 people who have done an incredible job in AirAsia. Please give them a round of applause uh, all over. There's the famous Irene Omar, who was just a bank assistant and is now the second most powerful person in AirAsia. And I want to highlight two pilots here, if you don't mind. So Coogan left school when he was 15 and was a dispatch boy. And his dream was to be a pilot. And I said, go for it. And he took the exam 11 times because his English wasn't so good. <laughs> Now his English is not so bad. <laughs> Otherwise, air traffic controllers wouldn't understand him. <laughs> but you know, I can say all the, all, I can speak all day, but this is living proof of what AirAsia is and what you can do. He never gave up. He kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And from a dispatch boy, he's now a first officer in AirAsia and he's on his way to becoming a captain. So, believe the unbelievable. And this young lady, not so young anymore, <laughs> I met her tuned in an UMNO function, and she had a lot of politician, father, mother, brothers, etc. And she said to me, my dream is to be a jet pilot. And I said, well, why don't you be? And she said, no women are pilots. And I went to my chief pilot, and I said, why are there no females? Um, in our airline, and he came up with the most ridiculous answer that could never be repeated. And I said, if a woman can run a country, she can certainly fly a plane. And actually, today, we have 350 female pilots. And with a... <laughs> we are the largest of any airline in the world as a percentage of female pilots to male pilots. <laughs> And the other day was history. Captain was female. Co-pilot was female. Chief engineer was female. All the cabin crew were female. And all the passengers were male. Uh, no, that bit's not true. And she was our first jet pilot. And she said to me, everyone says I'm too short. 
And I said, why is that a problem? Just move your seat forward uh, <laughs> to reach the pedals. And today, ladies and gentlemen, not only is she a captain of an A330, but she's also one of our best instructors in AirAsia. So I could spend ages talking about all my crew. There's Mabel over there, who has now uh, 200,000 followers on her Instagram. We have so many heroes and heroines in our company. So believe the unbelievable. Dare to dream. You're an amazing country. I don't think AirAsia could have succeeded anywhere else in the world because we have cultural diversity. We have Chinese, Indian, Malays, others, whatever. We have everything here to tackle Air Asia. And now we have built such a huge airline because we have amazing people. And here are just a few of them which I'd love to tell you more and more about. But I got to be on time like Air Asia. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, whatever you do, you've got to have fun and you've got to dream. And that man over there, it is a man, is my ex boss, Richard Branson, who lost a bet to me and had to be a stewardess on AirAsia. So the man who gave me a chance in my first job ended up working for me on AirAsia. <laughs> Dreams do come true. Dare to dream. It's okay to dream. Let people laugh at you because it's your dream. Believe the unbelievable. Because AirAsia is unbelievable. I was selling Dangdut music, and now I'm terrorizing airlines. And never take no for an answer. Tun, I hope we get our low-cost terminal. Thank you very much, sir. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. And make sure you fly on AirAsia. Bye. <laughs>